Um, so thank you everybody for coming. Uh, as John said, my name's Mort, or Richard Mortier. Um, I'm going to talk about a project, or some, one of the outputs of a set of projects, as noted there, um, which is a set of uh, pro uh, programming libraries in a language called OCaml uh, for doing numerical processing, uh, both locally and in a distributed fashion. Um, the work primarily was carried out by Liang Wang, uh, hence highlighted, but with support from Jinxin Zhao, who is a PhD student at Cambridge, uh, Tudor Tipley and Ben Catterall, who were both part three, so master students at Cambridge. Uh, ben was last year, Tudor is still doing his project this year. Um, unfortunately, Liang couldn't be here today. Uh, he had hoped to be, but isn't able to make it. He's moving back to uh, Finland currently. Um, okay, so uh, I'll start with a brief summary of where the project's at, where the, where the code is at, and the motivation, and then I'll try and move through some of the features uh, in, the, in the libraries that we've provided um, and finish up. Uh, there may even be a small demonstration in the middle. Uh, so the motivation really is about wanting to be able to write analytics code once, uh, write it once and deploy it everywhere, um, not in Java, obviously, um, but to write it write once and then be able to make it efficient to deploy everywhere in particular. So the code that we write should be concise, should be expressive uh, of the models that you're trying to, trying to implement, um, and it should be able to be compiled so that it is actually high, high performance. Um, what we did, what Liang primarily did in response to this, was build a set of libraries. So there are really three components, three li main libraries here. Uh, the main one is called OWL. So this is a numerical processing library in OCaml. Who programs in OCaml here? Has anybody ever programmed in OCaml here? Ah, one or two have a little bit. Uh, what about other functional languages like Haskell, Scala? Is okay, one or two, right. So OCaml is a functional programming language. Um, uh, it actually supports multiple paradigms, so it's functional, object-oriented, and imperative, primarily used in a functional fashion. So this is a numeric processing library for a camel. It turns out there wasn't one, uh, and it was actually quite a big gap in the, in the ecosystem for that language. Um, there's been quite a lot of interest simply in using OWL as a numeric library without any concern for any of the other features that we've added to it. With OWL, you get a tool called Zoo. Uh, Zoo is about sharing and reuse of analytics code and models. So the idea here is essentially you use the Zoo tool, you wrap up the model, wrap up the code that you've produced, um, possibly parameterizations and so on, and you publish that as a gist on GitHub, and then you can pull other people's models into your code with a couple of lines, basically a reference to the gist ID. Um, and this allows you to start to reuse models other people have produced to distribute models easily that you've produced. Um, what Jinxin, who is the the PhD student I mentioned on the first slide, is working on currently, in fact, is ways of making that a more powerful tool. So being able to do, for example, um, type safe uh, combination and composition of models from different sources. And then finally, Actor, uh, which I'll talk a bit about more towards the end, is essentially a way, a set of libraries that allow you to take models that you have built and try and turn them into parallel or distributed uh, models in a relatively simple, simplistic fashion. Um, so you can add just a couple of lines of code, and this allows you to um, distribute your model to run across multiple co cores or multiple machines. Uh, the status, this is after just over a year, I think now, of fairly intensive development. Um, so it's about 180,000 lines of code, uh, 6,500 functions, uh, just under 3,500 commits, and there's been 18 releases so far. And we've just moved all of the uh, re relevant repositories into the Albarn uh, organization. Um, we couldn't think of a better name. Uh, I should say, by the way, if you want to stop, and ask me, uh, stop me to ask questions at any point, please do. Uh, I have a terrible habit of just talking faster and faster unless people interrupt. I'll say a little bit about the motivating application for this. Um, I could talk at much greater length about this, but I won't in this uh, venue. Um, so the motivating application is a project called Databox. So the idea with Databox is we want to be able to construct a different way for people to manage processing and personal data. And the way that we're choosing to do that is to move from the current environment where data analysis tends to move data into the cloud and then process it in the cloud. So this is this picture here. So data is flowing from data subjects, from IoT devices, uh, from social networks, et cetera, et cetera, going into the cloud and then being processed in the cloud. What we're looking to do with the Databox project is think about can we flip that around and move the code to the data? So if we allow the data to reside locally with the data subject, perhaps they can exercise more control over it. Perhaps they can understand better what's being done with it and how it's being used. <coughs> and this means that we, to move the code to the data uh, in this fashion means that we will want to start to build analytics applications 
that will be able to analyze data that is now being spread across potentially millions of small devices rather than having been centralized into some large cloud service. Um, so that's the, this is the sort of the motivating example. We want to be able to spread data analytics across many, many, many devices uh, rather than centralizing the data to process in one place. We've gone through several sort of iterations of this within Databox, and where we're moving to at the moment is trying to get to sort of properly distributed inferencing and learning. So the, the starting point, as I said, was centralizing data for processing. We did a little bit of work, uh, which is going to be presented in a couple of weeks' time, on distributing models and then refining them locally. So you do an initial training phase using perhaps a small set of centralized data. And then having trained your model, you can then distribute the model to all the little data boxes out there and have it refine itself, refine that model locally using data that's specific to the data subject involved. So you can get more accurate more quickly by refining existing models. And what we're looking to do is go to this, as I said, this fully distributed inferencing and learning. So this is what we're looking to do. The sorts of backends we're looking to target with the code when we, when we compile code written with OWL uh, are quite varied. So we've got these sort of, you know, computers, obviously. Uh, we've got uh, things like Zen, uh, Zen hypervisor, so you want to target, uh, you know, AWS infrastructure, Azure infrastructure. Um, we're looking at using uh, unikernels. This is a, another project I've been involved in, which I won't say too much about, but this is essentially, unikernels are about taking application code and compiling it into essentially a bootable image. So something that can run directly on the, on the hardware or directly on something like a hypervisor. Um, <clears throat> Other forms of edge computing device, so IoT devices generally, so di small devices that sit at the edge of the network. And the thing that, in fact, Tudor, the student I mentioned on the first slide, has been looking at is using tool chains that allow you to compile OCaml into JavaScript. So we could take the models that you build with OWL and compile them to run in web browsers. Um, so you could re get really very distributed if you wanted to. I would love to do the stunt if, if he manages to get his project finished and working. I would like to do the stunt where we distribute a web page and then if people visit that web page all at the same time, uh, we can end up with I don't know, a million nodes taking part in a computation simultaneously. I think that would be quite cool. So, the architecture of AL. So as I mentioned, we've got AL, we've got Actor. <coughs> AL is the, the sort of the basis for all of this. So the, no, I don't get a mouse on that. So the libraries at the bottom there, is the, that's the core of the numeric processing environment. So we have an n-dimensional array, ND array, um, we link, can link against CBLAS and LAPAC, and then we've got some basic memory management and evaluation uh, functionality. On top of that, there's a set of analytics tooling that's been built um, for doing things like linear algebra, data visualization, uh, optimization, regression, algorithmic differentiation, um, and your sort of your expected mathematics and statistics uh, functions. And then on top of that, there's a set of composable services for doing various forms of machine learning, natural language processing, neural networks, um, CNNs, DNNs, and so on. And then the zoo system sort of sits inside there. So that's the, the set of tooling which allows you to distribute, uh, download, and compose these services. Separate to that, we have Actor. It's a separate repository. Um, and that essentially provides a number of different um, backends that allow you to distribute and parallelize models that you've written using OWL. Um, <coughs> and they all come down to there's a, there's a set of different uh, forms of distribution that can be applied there, but they all come down to some, some form of synchronous parallel machine, which I'll say a bit about uh, in the latter half of this talk. Uh, existing work that's going on, so as I've mentioned, Jinxian is looking at the zoo system and trying to make that a more powerful tool for sharing and in particular composing uh, existing systems, existing uh, models. Uh, ben did some work on a barrier control method uh, for distributed machine learning, which I'll talk about in the latter half of the talk. Um, then we have uh, work going on at the moment to do some optimizations to the parameter server engine, uh, looking at using linear types. Uh, Drup Makwana is another uh, student in Cambridge, um, looking at linear types for doing memory management for this sort of high performance uh, and GP, GPU numerical computing particularly. Um, and then Tudor, as I mentioned, is looking at compilation of OWL models into JavaScript so they can be run in browsers. So this sort of a set of the work, a fairly complete set of the work, I think, that's going on currently using this. So what does some code look like? So um, the NDRA is the underlying, underlying data structure, if you like. And there's four variants of this. So we can have single and double precision real numbers and single and double precision complex numbers. Um, and then there's an any model to deal with anything else. So you can create yourself, in this case, a, 
five by five by five matrix of booleans, which will be indicated as true. And then you can take slices out of that to take, take rows out of that. Um, so it's hopefully not too dissimilar to people who are familiar with using MATLAB and other such environments. This is not hopefully not too crazy syntax. One of the common complaints about using languages like OCaml is the syntax looks all weird. It's all different. Hopefully it's not too bad. Fundamental operations that are carried out. So indexing and slicing. Who doesn't know what I mean when I say indexing and slicing of arrays? So this is taking pieces out of arrays, larger arrays, and larger structures like matrices. So getting all the columns, or getting a particular column out of matrix, for example, would be a slicing operation. Um, the sorts of things you might write up there at the top for the NumPy library. Who uses NumPy? Python? Yeah, figures. Um, so that's probably that's one of the more popular ones out there. Um, so that's how you might uh, take a slice out of uh, an array in Python, or a matrix in that case, for the looks of it. Uh, Julia, similar sort of syntax. Al, slightly more character-heavy syntax, but not, not too much. So this is for taking, taking a slice out. Um, there's also, that's for the basic slicing. So if you just want to do sort of fairly simple operations. So you're doing essentially real indices into a matrix of real values. Um, you can do slightly fancier indexing using Al. So we have these get fancy and set fancy uh, functions, which allow you to pass in a list of different types of indexing um, value, I suppose. So you could index by having a single integer for a single, single index. You can index by passing in a list of integers, and you can index by passing in a range. So you have this i, l, and r uh, of int and int lists. So for example, uh, this piece down here <coughs> uh, is asking for uh, the fifth element uh, in, the, in the first uh, dimension, uh, then a list of indices for the second element, the first element, and the zeroth element in the second dimension, and then the range uh, in the, which won't go very far, I think, uh, but the range of elements then in the third dimension. So a fairly rich set of operators for allowing you to index the matrices and the other data structures you build up. Uh, we link against the uh, one of the plotting libraries, GLplot. So this is a relatively small plotting engine. Um, gives you sort of MATLAB style interfaces to plotting. Um, so there's a short piece of code here to generate some data. And then this is the code here that generates this plot image there. So it's hopefully, again, not too uh, unfamiliar syntax. Uh, this is a basic specification that everything is going to apply to get everything on the same orientation, all the subplots on the same orientation. Uh, then we're going to create a handle to the plot. In this case, it's going to output to plot017.png. And then just creating a set of subplots. So we've got a surface plot, mesh plot, surface plot with contour fills, surface plot with uh, put my contours down here, I think, uh, and then and so on. So different sorts of sorts of fills there. Um, so MATLAB-ish style code to generate uh, composite plots. So visualization is relatively straightforward to to add into these sort of these sort of programs. <coughs> One of the things that OCaml provides, which is not that common in many other languages, is quite a powerful module system. Um, in OCaml, they call this, they refer to these things as functors. So a functor is a function which takes modules and creates other modules from them. Um, so you can think of it a bit like a function. A function goes from values to values. A functor goes from modules to modules. So what we can do then is we can pass in to this make functor a module that satisfies the ND array signature and generate some new module from that which will have some new capabilities. So for example here, we're passing in a module that A that satisfies the, the ND array signature and by including the facilities of al alg algo diff generic there, we get a module that's got the algorithmic differentiation signature but has as its underlying representation for data whatever the module was that we passed in that satisfied the ND array signature. So it gives you quite a powerful way to compose uh, components of the system in different ways, all the time the compiler making sure that type checking takes place so that you can't compose things in a way that doesn't make sense. So you can build up fairly complex systems from this, starting out with a small number of components that, you, that you've expressed how, to how you should compose them together. So for example, when we have this algorithmic differentiation, does, who knows what I mean when I say algorithmic differentiation? Okay, about half the room. 
So you can do numeric differentiation, where you just divide things up into strips and do, do computations. You do symbolic differentiation, like, uh, well, at least I learned at school. I don't know how many people are younger here. You used to learn at school anyway. Um, <coughs> and then you can do algorithmic differentiation, which is essentially, repeat, you can think of it as repeated application of the chain rule in order to take a, pro, a piece of code that expresses some computation and create the differentiation, the differential of that. Um, it's fairly straightforward to do using some of the algorithms that are implemented in this library. And you can nicely chain things together. This is the pipeline operator. So think of it, it's like pipe in a, in a shell, but with an arrow telling you which direction things are going in. <coughs> so you can just repeatedly differentiate things to get the second derivative, third derivative, and so on. So it's quite, quite a nice way to be able to compose uh, the, the computation of a derivative. By using this throughout the library, uh, Liang managed to make the DNN module quite small. So it's only 2,500 lines of code <coughs> for a deep neural network implementations. And the, this is sort of being used throughout these different sorts of uh, these tuning systems, tuning algorithms. It makes it also fairly easy to extend these libraries. So you can add a new type of neuron, for example, um, and calculating derivatives automatically in the backpropagation phase. Um, so this is essentially the set of code that implements the, uh, the, the neuron described on the right there. So it's, it's, it's quite a, an expressive system. Right? You, can, you can get quite a lot of power out of it writing a relatively small number of lines of code. The sort of tracking that the environment does as you express these algorithms and you write the code means that you can also, for example, look at data flow graphs and extract data flow graphs from the code that you write. So in this case, we're expressing uh, a lazy computation. So we go lazy mate, so this is a functor, which is gonna be passed in the owl array type. Um, we'll create a couple of variables and then we'll create a data flow uh, computation, a data computation of that. Just gonna add those variables together, dot product the result against x, take the sign of that, absolute value of that, and so on. Uh, and go through all those different things. And then you can tell it to drop out a dot file representation of this, which you can then turn into a PDF using the standard dotty uh, tool chain. And that produces that graph on the right. So you can look at visualizing your computation and see what your computation is doing. <coughs> it's got facility for incremental computation. So um, because of the laziness involved here, uh, you can, when you redo the evaluation, so there's m.eval here, uh, the m is the, the module that was created on the previous slide, so this is the, the lazy computation module. Um, you can look at, as data flows through this and the computation is carried out, when you change the values that are going on, there's enough bookkeeping, if you like, in the code that's been generated that it knows it only needs to recomputate this part of the computation the rest of it's not going to change as a result. So this sort of incremental uh, evaluation makes, again, helps to make things efficient and keep things efficient. <coughs> and in particular, it means that you're not doing memory allocation, deallocation when you don't need to. You're only looking at the things that are actually changing, uh, changing as a result of the inputs changing. We have the ability to, right now, uh, to link against the, uh, what's it called, OpenCL for GPU programming. Um, so we've got a set of uh, facilities available in the library. Um, it ends up looking similar again to PyTorch and MATLAB. Uh, there's a feature that I think Liang just added in the last few weeks, which means that you can take existing OpenCL code uh, in C and sort of put that inside the OCaml code. And the necessary compilation takes place, so you can link things together very straightforwardly. We're trying to make it easy to make this, uh, this sort of the features of this library accessible from lots of other environments. <coughs> so some more examples of the expressiveness. So this is uh, an LSTM uh, for, uh, this is some natural language processing. I can't remember exactly what it was. Uh, the italicized components here are two uh, variables that are passed into the function. Um, and then you can compose this sort of model and the result is uh, using the same dumping it to dot file 
and then rendering it, um, you get this much more complex looking thing from a very small set of a very small set of code. Uh, similar thing here for uh, this convolutional neural network here. So you can see the convolutional layers going in. Uh, you put dropout phases in, and at the end you drop out the network. And again, you can then use that, evaluate that, um, render it, make use of it. Uh, I will now do a small demo. So that's what the result of doing this for the Inception V3 network looks, which is not terribly readable. Uh, but I can hopefully... Briefly show, uh, I have too many pixels on this screen now, thanks to HDMI. So if I take a handy pre-downloaded photo of a lion, so it's currently running, classification results, don't know if you can read that. Uh, lion, king of beasts, Pantheralia, etc. Um, so that's an implementation of the Google Inception image classifier. Um, it's just a little bit, if you go and look at the code there, in fact, why don't I show you the code there? Um, it should be just a little bit under 100 line, 150 lines. Uh, so this is the Inception model as implemented. So you get down to, yeah, 145 lines there, uh, including how it's getting called. So again, Hopefully I'm making the point here that this is expressive, powerful. You generate fairly compact code for implementing quite complex models. That's the material on OWL, the basic library. Any questions about that part? No, okay. I'll talk a bit now about Actor, which is not quite as stable yet, but works. Some value of works. Um, it's in particular, it's not released yet. So OWL, you can implement quite, you can install quite easily uh, using, if you're familiar with the OCaml uh, uh, ecosystem, there's a package manager called OPAM. You can do OPAM install OWL, and you get OWL installed, and it just kind of works. You've got all the tools there. Um, Actor, we haven't quite finished releasing yet. Uh, it still takes a little bit more to get going with it. But the point with OWL, with Actor, is it allows you to distribute the models that you might implement using OWL, and do so quite straightforwardly. <coughs> so you can basically plug together you know, different components from OWL with different backends from Actor, in this case the MapReduce engine. Uh, you might take a neural network and push it across the parameter server engine. You could take a neural network and throw it at the GP GPU. And the idea is that this should be straightforward to do and should produce reasonably performant code uh, that, that's, that is able to make use of these kind of distributed resources. So by way of example, if you take ND, an, uh, some piece of code written in OWL that's using the standard ND array, the core, the core array representation. Um, so you can write a map function, in fact we provide a map function for that. So this is a map is a function which takes a function that you pass in and applies it to every value in a list, for example, or in this case, an ND array. So dense.ndarray.s.map, sin x is taking the sine function and applying that to x, which is some ND array representation of some single precision real numbers. So what do we do when this ND array becomes distributed? Can we, can we make this code operate when the array, when the values you want to apply it to are now distributed across multiple hosts? So all we need to do is create a user functor, so in this case, al parallel make distributed, and pass in a module that represents the data that we're going to use, which in this case is the single precision dense ND array, and a module that represents a particular type of distributed computation, in this case, a MapReduce style computation. The result of doing that is this module M. And now when we do M map sine, so this is the higher order, this is a sort of currying of this function, what that is, the result of applying this M dot map to sine, is now something which is going to apply to a distributed array and produce a distributed array as a result. So you can now pass a distributed array into this same piece of code and it will automatically spread that code out across the machines run it across the data that's held locally. So by adding essentially one line, you've taken your centralized implementation and turned it into a distributed implementation. <coughs> you can do it to more complex things. So uh, if we look here, for example, uh, some simple convolutional network, neural network, um, 
you could do training locally then with this. So you take this OWL Neural S graph train network, so that's the, the sort of the standard implementation. To do parallel training on the cluster, you, provide, you combine that with the parameter engine, parameter server engine. So again, producing another module here using these functors that exist so that you're now going to spread things out using this actor.param. Uh, and then when you implement this, when you call this, you're going to be training the thing across multiple nodes in the cluster. We currently provide three engines for doing this, MapReduce engine, parameter server engine, and a peer-to-peer -peer engine, which is a simple distributed hash table implementation. They all rely on this synchronous parallel machine for synchronizing. So you need to be able to synchronize the computations that are taking place as iterations are being carried out. You want to have some kind of coordination between the multiple hosts that are performing the computation. Um, synchronous parallel machine is essentially an abstract computer that you use for designing parallel algorithms. So you assume that you've got a local processor with some fast memory. You assume you've got a network that's able to route messages between computers. And you assume you've got some means to synchronize the computation taking place on those computers. Um, it, these sort of, uh, this, this component, if you like, this model, is used as the building block for lots of different processing systems, Hadoop, Scar uh, Spark, et cetera, et cetera. The core of it is this way you deal with, co with coordination. You need to be able to synchronize the computation that's taking place across multiple machines. And what we're, what we're doing here is we're trying to think of ways that we will be able to make this work in this environment that we want to target from the start. So this idea that we've got millions of nodes now doing distributed computations. And you want to be able to make this sort of work in that environment. Um, so. <coughs> there will be several diagrams like this in the next few slides, so I thought I'd explain it. Um, you've got multiple processes carrying out computations. You've got iteration steps as you go through, as you run through the computation. And then you've got some kind of, in this case, synchronization that act to access some global state. So you've got these different threads all running along, uh, computing as they go. Progress is measured by super steps or iterations. Central server maintains some global state then there's going to be, need to be some communication that takes place in order to try and keep everybody synchronized so that nobody runs too far ahead. There are essentially three main ways that that synchronization takes place. So BSP is the one that, uh, in some sense, is sort of obvious. Um, so this is strict lockstep synchronization. Right? People, the processes compute till they get to the end of the iteration, then they wait for everybody else to catch up to complete their iteration. Once everybody's caught up, they synchronize, and then move on to the next iteration. So everything's happening in these lockstep. Uh, this is what's used by things like Hadoop, Scarp, uh, Spark, and so on. I don't know why I keep saying Scarp. Spark, and so on. So BSP um, is sensitive to stragglers. So if one of the nodes in your system is much slower than the others, then the faster nodes keep having to wait for every iteration for the slow node to catch up. So it gets very much affected by stragglers. But it's also fairly simple. It's quite deterministic. One iteration get to the end of the iteration, wait for everybody, move to the next iteration. So it's, all, it's relatively simple to understand and relatively simple to use to write applications. Um, if I move to the, the far right-hand side of the chart now, at the other extreme, you've got ASP. So ASP is essentially no communication. Everything just runs at its own speed, as fast as it can through the iterations that it's got to do. And there's no coordination, no explicit coordination between the processes performing the computation. So it's very fast. It's very scalable. As you add more processes, nothing has to slow down because everything just goes as fast as it can. Um, however, a lot of the updates will be noisy because you can end up with one of the processes computing much further ahead in terms of iterations than other processes. And so they've ended up going off in the wrong direction, essentially. And there's no coordination to bring them back into the same, into alignment with everybody else. <coughs> so there's no convergence guarantees in particular because a process can just go off into the wild of yonder. In the middle, you've got SSP. So SSP is a relaxed version of the strict synchronization. So you essentially, you allow some degree of straggling to take place. You allow the nodes performing the computation, the process performing the computation, to spread out slightly. They don't all have to be in strict lockstep synchronization. They're allowed to get a little bit behind each other. But when they get too far behind, then you're going to wait for them to catch up again. So you allow some spreading out to occur, but you don't allow sort of infinite spreading to occur, which is essentially what ASP allows. So these are the three main flavors of this form of synchronization. They are all used in different types of distributed computation environment. 
What do we want? Well, ideally, we want fast convergence for iterative learning. We want things to get to the right answer quickly. However, if we slow down the iteration rate, or the updates that have been provided are noisy, this is going to slow convergence down. So the way that this is normally handled, then, is you provide synchronization. If you provide synchronization, then you try and make sure that the updates are more uh, consistent. You reduce the update noise. The problem is that if you provide too strict a form of synchronization, you get the sensitivity to stragglers. And it means that as you add more nodes into your system, you're, sort of, you're more likely to get a straggler somewhere in there. And so things are going to slow down. So you don't get the perfect scaling you might hope for. Um, you also pay communication costs. So the more synchronization you're doing, the more likely it is that communication has to take place to provide that, which means that the more costly it is in a communication sense. And we're in a world where we'd really like to support extremely large systems with millions of nodes, and so that's not really going to work very well. The chances that you're going to manage to do this with a reasonable amount of communication overhead and being sensitive to stragglers, where in a million nodes, the chances are something is going to be straggling pretty badly, if not just turned off, um, is low. So we were thinking about this. So we looked at this and we sort of broke this down. So a simple analytic model of this would be that you're essentially, when you're doing iterative learning, you're going to do a sequence of updates to an initial global state. Updates could be noisy. They could be sort of incorrect in some sense, or they could be lost, or they could be delayed. Um, so you've got some initial global state, x0. You're going to apl apply a sequence of updates. Uh, we are a, the red ones are the the sort of uh, the non-noisy ones and the blue ones are the noisy ones. So you, got these, you can think of these as in two sets, A and B, for the not noisy and the noisy updates. And you're, you're iteratively applying this to this initial global state. If we think about this model and how you might express these different synchronous par parallel machines using this model, uh, you can think about the, the structures that get revealed. So we've got the three uh, synchronization primitives, BSP, SSP, and ASP. And if you think about what's going on here, on the left-hand side, we're modeling the consistency. So we've got this idea that the plus equals operator is a server logic that's able to incorporate updates. So as updates come in, they get incorporated into the initial global state, and that's happening iteratively. These are the iterations taking place. And then the right-hand side chunk of uh, Greek there uh, is modeling synchronization. So this is workers communicating either peer-to-peer -peer or with some kind of central server to coordinate progress. So in the case of BSP, for example, everything's deterministic. Every, everybody who's taking part in the computation waits for the update to come in before they go on to the next iteration. In the case of ASP, everything is non-deterministic. Things just run as fast as they can with no form of coordination between different nodes. In the case of SSP, you've got a mixture. You're allowing things to get a little bit out of date. And some of the updates can be noisy but then you're going to wait when they get too far out of date before things come back together again. So you've got these deterministic up updates and probabilistic updates that are going on in these three different approaches to the synchronization, to coordination. <coughs> it's often the case that the global state will become uh, a single point of failure. It tends to be managed by a central server. And it's also, I think, what well, we felt it was interesting to observe that you're coupling consistency here with synchronization um, for BSP and SSP. So these things here essentially become part of the global state. And ASP is just given up on that completely. You don't bother doing synchronization. You just let things, and so let things go. It kind of felt like there's a different, there's a, there's a conflation here of two things. One is the way that communication is occurring, or when communication is occurring, and the other is consistency of the computation that's being expressed. So if we think about this as, a, as two different dimensions, you've got some dimension of consistency. So ASP is kind of weak consistency. There's, there's no coordination taking place. There's weak consistency. Whereas BSP is clearly strong consistency. Right? Every iteration, you have to wait for everybody to complete to move on to the next one. You end up with low iteration rate for BSP. As you, as you increase the consistency, the iteration rate tends to slow down because you've got to wait for stragglers to catch up. When you're allowing things to become inconsistent, then you can increase the speed of iterations. You get a higher iteration rate. However, there's, all, there's a sort of st a different thing going on here as well, which is that when you're doing this very kind of highly synchronized, strict synchronization, uh, you end up with a sort of centralized behavior. So it's a fully centralized kind of update process. The updates are being incorporated by a single node. 
before allowing everybody to be released again to go to the next iteration. When you're doing ASP, it's in some sense it's fully distributed. There's no central node involved in that. There's no single point which is receiving the updates to allow nodes to continue. So it seems like there's this, you can, you can pull these two things apart perhaps between consistency and synchronization. <coughs> SSP generalizes across consistency. It allows you to have different degrees of inconsistency between the, the iteration states that different nodes are in. But it's not really doing anything about the centralized versus the decentralized uh, axis, if you like. And so we started thinking, well, what, what could you play with along that axis in or order to perhaps make the system more scalable by being able to control the amount of update that needed to take place? So we were proposing uh, a different type of synchronization, uh, barrier control, if you like, probabilistic synchronous parallel. So this is exploiting consistency by sampling from among the worker population. So all the nodes taking part in the computation, we don't need to listen to all of them. We're going to sample from some of them. And we believe we should be able to do this because we have such a very large number of nodes. Well, obviously, if you've got two or three nodes, it's not really sensible. So we're now replacing deterministic and probabilistic components with this sample distribution of which nodes we're going to wait for updates from. And then we can enforce consistency within a small group of the workers. So we can then have a server, that, for example, is incorporating the submitted updates. But we don't need to have a central coordinating server for the whole population. We can have a coordinating server for each of these small groups, each, each of these sample groups. Um, and the, uh, the hypothesis, the belief is that then you can have sort of synchronization almost propagates through overlaps between these groups. But you don't need to have one node looking after the entire population. You hope that none of these little subgroups gets too far out of whack with each other because everybody's kind of, there's a little bit of overlap between all these subgroups. <coughs> so we add a new primitive to the system called sample. Um, we try and make sure that we're guaranteeing random uniform sampling by having nodes organized in a structured DHT. So we've got the standard kind of uh, address assignment process identifier assignment there, which is distributing these identifiers across all the nodes uh, uniformly. And we can, in fact, estimate the population size and therefore be able to work out how big a given sample should be for a given sampling rate by looking at how uh, many IDs have been allocated, looking at the density of ID allocation. And you can then apply this primitive to existing synchronization primitives in order to give you, hopefully, a more scalable version of those primitives. So it ends up as, a, if you like, a higher order function. You, you take this sample function, you apply it to uh, BSP or SSP to get a probabilistic version of those algorithms, of those uh, barrier functions. So you're composing sample function with the barrier function. And the claim that we're making is that this adds this kind of extra dimension of completeness. Uh, so we can parameterize between a fully centralized system and a fully distributed system and therefore look at the convergence rate, now not just being about the consistency of the sample and the rate of iteration, but also the completeness of the sample. <coughs> so you can hopefully then look at saying, well, if I sample too few nodes, I'll have too little information coming in. If I sample too many nodes, I start to become affected by stragglers again, but I can at least look at that, look at varying that parameter to work out where is the most efficient place for me to be for a given data set, for a given computation. So this is what we're, we're doing now when we model the sampling. We're going from this sort of world where we had streams coming in to a centralized thing. We apply the sampling function. We can now look at distributing across different nodes um, and listening to only some of the nodes for each of those streams. If you take a smaller sample size, you, have, you can have more sampling processes, each of which will have a less complete view of the original data set. It's not dealing with as much because you have a smaller sample size. And that means that you can reduce the synchronization required between the nodes as they're taking part in the computation. So by applying this sort of PSP here, we can look at the deterministic and probabilistic components uh, kind of coming together and being able to move between where you want to be in terms of what you're, what you're sampling. So BSP and SSP, in terms of the way you build systems, BSP and SSP are, are fully centralized systems. Uh, PSP and ASP are fully, or are distributed systems. ASP is fully distributed, 
PSP allows you to sort of trade this off. <coughs> um, PSP, unlike SSP, is decoupling consistency from synchronization. So we're allowing you to become uh, not just inconsistent, but you're allowing different subgroups in the population to proceed at different rates. Um, but it's not going whole hog like ASP does and allowing just everybody to go off independently. And so we added this to, this, to the actor system, um, and it implements it in this, using this modular fashion, using these functors. <coughs> so you can plug it into different engines. So you can produce probabilistic versions of the existing backends quite straightforwardly. So when we compare it to existing uh, synchronization methods, uh, against BSP, you're looking at faster iterations, uh, faster convergence, and a decentralized system. You're not reliant on a single centralized node to maintain strict coordination, strict synchronization among all nodes, all worker nodes. Compared to SSP, you get faster iterations and faster convergence, and you're decentralized. Compared to ASP, then, we, have, we actually do provide some consistency guarantees. We're not being completely allowing any form of inconsistency to arise. And so we can do better, better convergence guarantees, but we do have a bit of coordination going on there. Have you looked at all? I mean, you're assuming randomness of, of sampling there. Have you looked at all at assigning higher weights to nodes which are more important for consistency? What would higher weights mean? So you mean in terms of the computation being carried out or trying to make them more reliable? Or, or, tr or weighting for them more? Uh, no, we haven't tried that. We could try that. Um, I think... That touches on a problem with this approach, uh, which we haven't solved, which is uh, what happens essentially when you don't sample the nodes that matter, right? When essentially when your sampling is biased, that introduces a bias with relation to the computation that's being carried out, yeah. which is a sort of an open, open issue with this approach. Um, we have an implementation of this in the actor module. We did some simulation work on it to try and see how this would behave, and in particular whether it would actually help uh, or not. So we're looking at the distribution of steps, so how far along have worker nodes managed to get? How far along has the computation proceeded? So this is steps or iterations on the exit axis. And then how many nodes that are at that point in the computation? <coughs> so if we look at 1,000 nodes taking, performing the computation, uh, in this case, the, the thing being simulated was linear regression using stochastic gradient descent. Um, we looked at a sample size of 10, and we allowed up to a degree of staleness of four, so nodes could be up to four steps away from each other. Um, and what you find is that BSP sort of kind of as you expect. So BSP is very strict synchronization, so everybody is at the same point in the computation. They get to the same step at the same time, but it's not got as far along because things have had to wait sometimes for the slower nodes to catch up. Um, ASP is way out at the other end, where there's quite a big spread in how far nodes have got because some nodes went fast, some nodes went slow, um, but there is a big spread there, so they're quite, they're sort of relatively speaking inconsistent as to where they're up to in the computation. Interestingly then, so SSP allows a little bit of spread, it's probably quite hard to see, but there is a little bit of spread there in terms of the computation step different nodes have got up to. Um, and they've got to sort of 210 iteration in this particular example. And then the probabilistic versions of BSP and SSP are both further along in the computation but are also still relatively tightly uh, packed around a particular point. So you haven't had too much spread in some sense. You've had less spread than you might, you might get, certainly with ASP. <coughs> and if we look at the, um, uh, the CDFs of these in terms of uh, how far things have got, ASP, you, know, you get this quite large spread in terms of the proportion of the nodes that have got to a particular iteration. Um, PBSP and PSSP are both still fairly tight, fairly vertical. SSP is more vertical, but is a little bit slower. BSP is just a straight line, but is quite a long way back. So you can trade off the spread versus the speed of the computation in terms of how fast you're getting, how far through you're, you're getting after a fixed period of time in this case. When you start to look at the sample size, you can kind of trade off how um, tightly synchronized you want to be and therefore how far along you're going to get. So a sample size of zero, that's essentially turning into ASP. Right? You're not doing any coordination between any of the nodes. Um, in this case, you know, a sample size of 64, so quite, relatively speaking, big 
samples in the population, tightens things up a lot, but also slows things down a lot. And so you can trade off this, this parameter and pick where you want to be on that. Have you looked at dynamically working out this um, sample size? So if your data is becoming too spread, you can change it as your <coughs> progress through your data? Uh, not in any detail yet. We thought of various things that could be done here, but we're still working on doing an actual evaluation of the basic, the basic system first. Uh, but when you introduce an extra parameter like this that you can now play with, it does make it, there's a lot of things you can do to sort of automate and make that more efficient, hopefully. <coughs> so yeah, so the, the basic thing is here, here is smaller sample sizes, faster iteration, uh, but allow greater spread between the points that the system's got up to. Um, so this, these plots, I should say, by the way, were produced by Ben Catterall, who was a, a student with us last year, master's student. Um, so he did a lot of simulation work on this. And so you can now look at starting to tighten the bounds. So you look at reducing the area beneath the curve, and you can again um, change this sampling parameter in order to try and get things either more, to be able to get things more tight or allow things to, get, to move further apart. <coughs> And you'd, uh, these are essentially outcomes of some analytic modeling he did of this. So you can, you can create some closed form expressions for how, how these kind of systems will work. We now looked at increasing what the scalability of this was going to be. So as we increase the system size, as we increase the number of worker nodes um, for a given sample size, so in this case a sample size of 10, and we're looking at the performance degradation, so the percentage change in the accuracy after each given iteration, a given point in, the, in time. So when we look at how this has gone, as you've increased the number of nodes now on the x-axis, you look at the percentage of changes, so, so how, how much uh, error, if you like, the performance degradation is being introduced. ASP is a straight line. So the green line here, the green boxes, that's pretty straight. So as you'd expect, as you increase the number of nodes in the system, it doesn't really change how the thing performs, because each node is running independently of every other node. BSP and SSP both get degraded. So these are the, the blue crosses and the red circles. They're both getting worse because they have to synchronize, so they're having to wait for things to catch up. PSP actually gets a little bit better. It actually improves as you increase the number of nodes in the system, which was a little bit uh, disconcerting when we first saw that. And What's essentially happening here is the convergence rate is being accelerated because you are reducing the number of noisy updates. So you're removing the effect of, you're removing some of the noise in the updates by having some synchronization take place without introducing, obviously this is based on the network parameters that you're looking at, without introducing too many stragglers, or in particular without introducing too much straggling of nodes in the system. <coughs> so by applying this kind of sampling primitive, we can effectively accelerate the convergence rate because we can increase the iteration rate and keep the consistency reasonable as well. So we're not losing consistency in order to increase uh, the iteration rate. And what this means is the sort of the utility of each submitted update is increasing. Right? You, get, you get more updates of more, that are more use in the system. So that's kind of where we sit at the moment with this probabilistic sampling. Uh, are there any questions about that part? Yeah, well, so at the moment, right, you're at the mercy of understanding the thing that you're distributing because with uh, you know, linear regression, it's going to converge come what may, and so the increase in iteration rate will really win, whereas with some other schemes, it may not converge if you choose the wrong synchronization primitive. So isn't that at odds with the original goal that the whole owl actor zoo world which is to make life easier for programmers which you have until you go and now you have to pick one of these complicated things for paralyzing your code and we can't tell you which is the best one because you have to really know how i wouldn't say it's at odds i'd say we still have work to do yeah, okay. um, <laughs> is that not a machine learning problem of itself ah good point yes because if we if we look at weighting given regions and alter, if we have a tunable parameter we therefore you can learn that we just let it run and optimize with respect to time. 
sense. Yeah. I guess you could do that, although would you be able to do that while it remained distributed or would you have to centralize it to learn that and then I don't know. But yes, I the I think the the underlying message would be that there's a parameter here that can be tuned. And so there's gonna yeah. be multiple ways it can be tuned. I think in terms of what you might need to do in order to avoid getting sort of from a networking point of view, I'd say crosstalk between the two components in the system, the distribution layer and the sampling layer, is you might need to think more about the bookkeeping you did of the computation that's being carried out and look at what that was doing in terms of the data it was accessing and the computation it was carrying out on that data to see whether you had ended up in a situation where the nodes you happen to be sampling because of the way the sampling has taken place and the node ID allocation has taken place are actually the nodes that are always quiet or always do the same thing. So as soon as you get any correlation there, you're at risk of having your computation become biased, I think. So I think for some parts of the problem, this is just a straightforward optimization problem of choosing the parameters slightly and just get the maximum speed up to the iteration rate. For other parts of the problem, it's going to be a really complicated search space to figure out what the right mix of synchronization primitive and parameters are. It's a classic case saying blackboard, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I don't know that, sorry. It's a well, um, ancient uh, system where basically you had a bunch of knowledge sources sharing a, a data space, relatively high performance, relatively high communication speed. But each one, each uh, contributor to the overall solution set put forward some weighting right. in a context for how, how fast it could move forward. So, yeah, yeah, it's similar to some work I'd done previously at Microsoft where uh, we had a distributed database called Magpie, uh, called, Magpie, called Seaweed. Uh, Seaweed. seaweed. Um, of course, yes. So this was um, the idea that you may have every node in a corporate network is producing data. In this case, it was monitoring its network mo network behavior. And you want to be able to query across that. And in that case, for example, we had a distributed hash table which was allowing nodes to share with their neighbors some metadata about the data they held. The idea being that then when you introduce the query, even if some nodes are turned off, and there always were some that were turned off, you could get an estimate of how long the query would need to run for to wait for those nodes to come back online. So I think there's this sort of the bookkeeping that's necessary to do in order to track this, we haven't worked out yet. But I think you certainly could do bookkeeping in the, in the work nodes in the system that would allow you to do those kind of optimizations and heuristics on top. So if you're talking about you know, potentially millions of devices, how do you handle the failure of a set of those nodes? Uh, so I think the idea would be that uh, assuming that the nodes that fail, there's no correlation among them with respect to the computation you want to run, you would hope that you can deal with that essentially just by ignoring them because you're doing enough sampling that hopefully you don't care if 100,000 out of the million are gone. It doesn't, hopefully doesn't make too much difference. If those 100,000 out of the million that are gone all have a particular feature which you won't then see, then yes, you have a problem. It would have an effect if there was a bug in one of a particular value sent to any number of machines will crash. Yes. Yeah, and you know, if, for example, again, if you're doing this in the, the network monitoring example, and it turns out that when the ISP goes offline, all the nodes that have information about the network also go offline, then yes, that's not going to work well, so I well. Mean, I think another <laughs> example of that would be, which is one thing we've looked at, which is um, trying to create a accurate model of electricity consumption or gas consumption, water consumption, so you have a model parameter server and you create this, this model and you have maybe 16 kinds of household, 100 kinds of household. But if uh, one of the parameters is reliability of electricity supply and you don't get an answer from the unreliable people, then you're, you're systematically yeah. biased. That would be a very simple example of where it would be a, an issue, I think. Uh, yeah, so there will be systematic biases. You have to be careful about it. Sorry. But another thing, if you're running this you know, quite complex computation on phones, um, surely that's going to have problems with power consumption because you know, um, laptops and phones yep. are very limited on the energy they can carry and they don't want them being burned up in their pocket yep. you know, doing a massive deal there. So uh, for myself, I was thinking of targeting this more at the set-top box environment rather than phones per se, but um, the code that gets output from AL, the camel code that gets output from this, is reasonably efficient. So we had some data, which I think I've dropped the slide out of this slide deck for some reason, 
uh, unless it's the last one, it's not, um, where it's more efficient, for example, than TensorFlow and uh, Cafe, I think it was. Um, so it, it's, it can part this, the compilation tool chain here is, is quite good. Our camel is quite a well-established and efficient language, so you can produce quite high efficiency code from it. Um, so it, it, yes, there will still be energy problems if you run this on devices with batteries. Um, there always will be, but we hope that it is feasible to do so, at least. Uh, and this, I kind of I mentioned at the start, was about the, the zoo tool, which is about sharing snippets. So you essentially add a few directives at the start of uh, an owl script, and you can start pulling in other people's models and <coughs> composing those models, um, which is quite interesting. At the moment, the way that that's uh, what Jinxin is looking at doing with that is integrating that with a software development environment that we've produced for this data box tool, where the idea is you can, this is a, what's called, has anybody heard of Node-RED? So this is a sort of a graphical programming environment from IBM where you can drag and drop data sources, computation nodes, and output nodes, and lo link them together. So we've taken that and added, uh, extended it so that it allows us to produce applications for Databox where you can basically put together data sources and computation, click a button, and it, it produces the Docker container, which is the application in this case. Um, and the idea would be that start to look at when you hook these things together, can you use type information from the gists that, are, that you are hooking together, essentially, in order to try and make sure you're, you're doing only valid computations. And with that, I will finish just about on time. Great.